For the last lecture in this series of lectures, we now turn to what happened after Columbus and the Spanish arrived in the Americas in 1492. Well, the Spanish, and after them, the Portuguese, and the English, and the French, quickly encountered the native peoples of the Americas. And things could not have gone more wrong. For a variety of reasons, the Indian populations were decimated, principally by diseases, strains of viruses brought to the Americas by Europeans, viruses that Native Americans had no immunity to, having been isolated from the Europeans for so long. And so the Indians began to die quickly and in great numbers, which in no way negates how terribly these Europeans treated the Indians. While diseases claimed the majority of native victims in the Americas, horrific deaths were also due to the cruelty of their European conquerors who abused and enslaved the Indians, forcing them to work their plantations and dig their mines. Even centuries later, Indian communities continued to be attacked if the descendants of those same Europeans found a reason to want those Indian lands for themselves, such as the presence of gold on the land. Why such hostility? Europeans quickly noticed a lot of differences between themselves and the Indians. These weren't just simple things you could ignore, but things that generally matter to people, including family and kinship. Back in the old world of Europe, the basic unit of the community was one form or another of nuclear family, a family based on marriage or conjugal ties, you know, the father, the mother, and their kids. In contrast, New World Native American cultures typically formed into extended families based on blood ties. Family was still the basic unit of the community, but these were much larger families in which marriage was not as important as the consanguineal ties that held an Indian community together. Marriages could be dissolved, but one's ties to kin remained until death. Several families could be bound together through the clan in which they shared membership. Clan members were bound together by the belief in a common ancestor. Larger extended clans constituting several villages are known as tribes. Europeans were expected to remain loyal to their monarch. Remember King James back in Britain? He argued that the king, like God, is father to the people, and the people must be loyal to their father. But in reality, monarchs were almost never one's actual relatives. In contrast, Native Americans were more devoted to their kin, their family. Women's rights was another area of culture that sparked concern among Europeans. Many Indian cultures were matrilineal, in contrast to the patrilineal Europeans. Europeans typically trace their family through the father's line, but many Indians trace their families through the mother's line, not the father's. Moreover, some of these matrilineal Indian cultures were also matrilocal, again, in contrast to patrilocal Europeans. When some Indian men married, they moved into the wife's home. This obviously affected marriage and divorce. Divorce existed in both societies, European and Native American. However, while the right to divorce in Christian Europe, especially among Catholics, was quite restricted and typically limited to men, divorce was not seen as the end of the world. It didn't threaten blood ties, after all. And women in some American tribes could divorce their husbands if they so desired. Among the Hopi, for example, women own the land and the homes and all the food grown on the land. When a Hopi man marries, he moves into his wife's home and works for her. If she becomes dissatisfied with him, she can always divorce him. And because everything belongs to her anyway, divorce could be as simple as throwing her husband's things out. He has no choice but to collect his things and go back to his own family. Now, that much authority in the hands of women already disturbed the European conquerors, but there was more. When Europeans met Indian tribes, they demanded to speak to the leader, whom they assumed would be a man, a chief, something like their own kings or queens back in Europe. And there were chiefs of some tribes, but there were also councils in other tribes in which chiefs or representatives came together to discuss intertribal matters, which is what the Iroquois feder Federacy was all about. How to bring peace to warring tribes while still respecting tribal autonomy. The chiefs 
of five different tribes among the Great Lakes of North America would come together to resolve issues between the tribes. And all of those chiefs were men. But who chose them? Who nominated a man to become chief of a tribe, say among the Seneca natives? The matriarchal leaders of important families. So, the grandmothers of the families, let's say. And often those matriarchs could remove those men from the councils if they were not happy with the work they were doing. As for Europeans, well, they didn't want to talk to councils, and they certainly would not waste their time speaking to men who had been elected by women. In fact, European leaders were not actually elected, were they? Hereditary rule was still commonplace. You were king in France or England, let's say, because your father was king before you. No electors. In the end, the power and influence of women in Native American cultures was clearly quite different from the subordinate role played by women in Europe and could in fact be seen by Europeans as dangerous as it threatened the traditional power of European men and their monarchs. Decision making in some Indian communities was thus achieved by consensus, a consensus involving men and women and based on blood family ties. And individuals who failed to follow the wishes of the community could be shamed into doing so or even ostracized from the community if they persisted in their antisocial behavior. In other words, Indians who refused to follow the rules of their society could be isolated and cast out from the tribe, a horrible fate for Native Americans. Conversely, European societies generally punished or imprisoned criminals within the society, a penal system which was not necessary among Native Americans. But it wasn't just people who were involved in the Indian way of thinking, the native conception of the world around them. While European Christians believed that only humans possessed a soul, which comes from God, Indians felt that all life held within it a spark or spirit from the great sea of spirit, the Zuni of New Mexico might say. Humans, animals, birds, trees, plants, it all has spirit. And so all life must be respected, not just human life. Which brings me to the question of religion. And women could play a very important role here as well, including that critical role as the source of life. For instance, an Iroquois belief describes how a beautiful pregnant woman, Ata Ensik, fell from the sky to be saved by birds. These birds carried her gently down to the earth which had been raised up for her on the back of a great turtle. And there, this mother goddess of all life gave birth and planted seeds, and from these seeds sprouted all of nature, while humankind was born from her womb. You can easily see how sacrilegious this view might seem to Europeans, who claimed that all of creation came from a single male god, not from a woman who fell from heaven. This European monotheism stood in stark contrast to the Native American polytheism and animism, which recognized many gods and many spirits dwelling in the natural world around us. Europeans viewed the earth as having been created for their benefit, and they were free to exploit its resources, including buying and selling land. But the Indians often rejected the idea of private property. The land is for all life, including the animals, and even though they did hunt and kill animals, they did not hunt them for pleasure, for sport, the way Europeans did. In addition, they were careful to thank the spirits of those animals for helping the Indians to survive. 